Good morning, Breakfast with Bacon fans. I am Dr. Christine Bacon, but I'm pretty sure you knew that already. And my guest today is the beautiful Angela Erickson. Uh, she's the mother of five now, little teeny weenies. And she is also, besides a mother and a wife, she is also uh, educated and degreed in, in communication. She got her degrees from in mass communication and your minor is also in communication. Was that from St. Cloud University? Yeah, St. Cloud State. Yeah, St. Cloud Mass State communications in... with an emphasis in advertising, and then a minor in communication studies. So, so yep. we both are communication because you're the mass media side, I'm the interpersonal communication side. But we're today going to talk a lot about interpersonal. You also have a radio show. I almost I want to make sure I don't mess that up. You have a radio show called Living the Gospel of Life. You co-host that with uh, Brian Gibson. And that's with Pro Life Action Ministries. And I'm just going to shoot you out here. That's on Twin Cities Relevant Radio Affiliate, 1330 AM. Yeah, W L O L, 1230 yeah. every Saturday. But I'm guessing you post it someplace so we can catch it after the fact as well. Yeah, absolutely. So you can also find it on the Pro Life Action Ministries website under. Um, they, they kind of have a lot of stuff going on on their website, but if you do some digging under education, you can find living the gospel of life. And every week that gets updated with the most recent episode and the archives. So, yeah, but you, I found you cause you've got integrated. Angela is your podcast and yeah. tell us what does that mean? What is integrated Angela all about? And by the way, everybody sees baby number five yeah, popping sorry. up and down. She is allowed yeah. to be on the broadcast. <laughs> <laughs> That's one thing I love about work, you know, doing stuff with Catholic or pro-life po podcast podcasts and yeah. radio shows babies are always welcome that's right we um, want to see more than the top of her head though can i see her face <gasps> this Hi, is princess. veronica yes Aww, two weeks um, old right yep two weeks old now so congratulations um, thank you so much yeah um so integrated with angela erickson is a podcast that really shoots to bridge the intellect and the will together um i I really think that we live in an age, obviously, where Gnosticism is very alive and well, and there is this disconnect where people want to pretend like their bodies are disconnected somehow from their souls right. or vice versa. Uh, and I think that is a source of a lot of unhappiness and dissatisfaction because it's a rejection of our nature. And so yeah. with the podcast, we, I bring on guests and we explore different topics because our faith is very much a body and soul faith from the sacraments, we experience things physically and they point to spiritual dimensions of our souls, all those things. So um, trying to bridge the gap there and hopefully push people in the direction of finding true integration so that they can be healed yeah. and be better disciples for Christ. Yeah, body, mind, and spirit. And you're right, so many people go and they go see a psychiatrist or psychologist to try to fix the mind. They go to a gym to fix the body, but we always seem to either miss the soul or put it last without realizing yeah. all of it needs to be healed. So, yeah. um, but you've got a good reason for kind of this integration. And that's what we're going to focus on today because Angela and all of you who've been following me know how passionate I am about saving marriages. And I want to make sure we say right up front that this show is not designed to shame anyone because we know half of you out there are divorced. The other half is a child of divorce. So nearly 100% of us have divorced somewhere in our families or siblings. So we're not judging anybody. We are not, you know, trying to call out our parents per se. Um, but, but we are always told that the children of divorce should be resilient. They've got this. But I, I do need to stress that, you know, when a child is wounded, mommy and daddy are the first ones to run to heal that wound. But when mommy and daddy are the inflictors of that wound, that makes it problematic when the child's like, mommy, I'm hurting and they want to be able to voice it. That's not when mommy and daddy usually say, oh, sweetie, come to me. I'm so sorry I hurt you. It's like, you know, suck it up. This is the way it's got to be. You got to get better. So I'm a child of divorce, the adult child. So I know where you're coming from, uh, but I'd like to turn it to you. What what made you start, Angela, really kind of getting into the, we call them ACOD, HL, uh, adult child of divorce, kind of um, talking space? Yeah, that's a really good question uh, because I think for most of my life, I didn't realize quite the impact that my parents divorce had had on my own life. Uh, I think it's probably because as a child 
kind of like what you're talking about. And we're kind of expected to be quiet about it. And there are so many reasons for that. One, because we don't want to hurt our parents more than they're already hurting. Um, And two, we don't want to be burdensome. And three, because we don't want to, we're fearful of rejection from our parents more than we've already experienced. And so um, not only are we afraid of hurting them, we're afraid of expressing our own hurt because we don't want them to pull away more than they may or may not already have. So for most of my life, I think I acted out in different ways, not realizing that it was somewhat related to the divorce. Uh, But it wasn't until I got married and was well into my marriage. My husband and I have been married eight and a half years now. And I was realizing I was having a really hard time accepting him loving me. Um, I just never felt worthy enough. Like I always had to earn love. And no matter what I did, I just always, you know, I internalize things. I'm very hard on myself. I don't know if that's common among (laughs) children who have uh, parents who have divorced, but I just, I'm, I'm my worst critic. And I sort of realized that this was rooted in how I was dealing with my parents' divorce and not seeing that unconditional love um, that you're supposed to witness in between your parents um, and have that sort of poured out onto you in addition as a child. So, um, and that's not to say my parents don't love me unconditionally, but you know what I mean? Like, it's just, they different. don't love each other unconditionally. Exactly. There and are that conditions. Pours out. Yes. And that pours over. It's like when your cup overflows, like that's part of the beauty of uh, being married is that you love someone so much that new life comes into the world. Right. Yeah. And so it's the same thing in general, when you're talking about the physical aspect and again, the spiritual aspect that love overflows and it flows down to your children and your grandchildren. And so I sort of had to reevaluate and look at where those wounds were coming from. Um, the, the father wound, the mother wound and how those things were impacting my marriage and my understanding of self and my own worth. And so it took me a long time to come to a place where I could accept my husband's love um, and not be fearful of him turning away, rejecting me, leaving me, um, or finding things to hold against me. You know, it's just such a, it was, it was very eye opening for me. And I realized that it impacted how I viewed God, the father, because again, um, I sort of felt like I had to earn his love. I couldn't really understand what it was like to have a a father that just loved me and created me out of that love. Um, so, Did, so how old were you, Angela, when your parents divorced? I was about six. Mm-hmm. So sorry, I'll get her on the other side. <laughs> totally a Catholic show, right? Yeah. So you're six years old. How did you initially feel if we went back there? Did, did your parents understand that this was hurting you? And what, what kind of messages did you get back then? Did you see mom? Did you see dad? Did you see them both equally? Did you feel they were pitted against each other? Kind of put us in that space. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I don't think I've ever been asked that question before. Sorry, count on me giving you nine questions at once. <laughs> that's great. No, I'm, I'm, you know what, I'm so good with that. So as a child at six years old, I think I've always had the mentality of like being strong for other people. And so I really feel like I buried it. Um, I can recall things like laying on the couch where my dad would sleep, you know, when he was in trouble um, and just burying my face in the pillow that was there because it still smelled like him Aww. after he, he left. Um, and you know, those are the silent sufferings that children don't speak about. I wasn't ever saying to anybody, I'm doing this because it smells like my dad, but I recall it. Yes. Oh. Yeah. Years later, you now know why. Oh, that's why I did it. Yeah. Wow. And too, I think then as I got, as I got older, I tried to understand his addiction. So I would do class projects on alcoholism to try and understand him and his vices um, and try to come to terms with that. Um, you know, I was always trying to understand and I can see it over the course of my life, different things that I was doing. Um, but it, as a child, yeah, we had the every other weekend visitation and that was really difficult. There were a lot of secrets that were kept because things were, were happening, you know, that were wildly inappropriate, things that my sisters and I were exposed to. Um, but we also didn't want to lose that time with our dad. So there was always this balance um, and there was definitely a lot of animosity between my parents. It wasn't one of those amicable divorces um, that we, we hear about. Um, it was very much, it was nasty. 
I yeah, mean, one of the things that bothers me is when people say, well, we are better friends now than we were then. And I look at them and say, if you can get along now, you can remarry and get along again. It's all a choice. Yeah. And your kids would prefer it. Well, my kids really love their step parents. I didn't say that they didn't. Right. But they want you and their biological parent together. Well, that's yeah. not what they say. And so many kids will say that when they're little. Um, but, you know, as they age, uh, for instance, one of my grandsons had said to me when he was seven and his parents first split, if either of my parents remarry, I'm moving in with you. And I was like, mm, and he goes, I'm serious. And now that he's almost 16, he said, no, it's whatever. That'll never happen. I don't care. And he does care. But, you know, at almost 16, he's like you, not aware of it's still there. It's something you've been forced to get used to. It doesn't matter if the girl that daddy's with is very nice. It doesn't matter if the guy that mommy's with is very nice. Ideally, mm. the kids want mom and dad together so they don't have to deal with any animosity. Carry their clothing from home to home and, you know, yes. st stuff like that. The, the, the a child of divorce things that the rest of us don't think about, which is like, why do they? They're like little vagabonds that have to, they, they don't want to part from their stuff because I don't want it to get lost at mom's, get lost at dad's. I just want it always with me. And so the things that we see that they may not yet be understanding why they do it because this is a life they've always had to live. So, you know, is that kind of the things you, that's all right, do what you have to do. I'm trying to kill time while you get her. Settled. I know she's struggling right now. So uh, we're not hiding anything. We have nursing mothers right in front of us. So yes, we do. Thank I think you. the average guest understands what's going on, but she's precious. And I love, love, love that you nurse your children. That That's a show that we should do sometimes too. Oh, that would be fun. The nursing shaming. Oh my gosh, don't do that in public. And yet you have breasts everywhere on movies like, and things. Yes. Yep, Did you see the Oscars? That. All it was was breasts with people attached. Yes. You know? 100%. <laughs> um, so. so, of course, she was sleeping blissfully. And then. I know she was before we went on the air, yep. which is okay. Um, so, if you're able to talk while you're taking a break, so we're just kind of thinking about. Um, those types of things, you know, having to go to daddy's house and did you take things with you now that you're looking back at it? Did you feel like it wasn't your home? Um, how did you feel oh, at yeah. mom's house? You know, did you feel like that was home? Um, I think I always felt like school was a reprieve, you know, like I loved going to school because the things were so much more simple yeah. and structured. My mom was a single mom with four girls, so she was working, um, and I loved the stability that school provided. Uh, so I thrived in school and that was sort of where I chose to, you know, I looked forward to going to school every mm -hmm. day. That was where I, and then, and then when I was at home, I spent most of my time outside playing, you know, it was just, you know, and those are the things that I think were beautiful about my childhood anyways, that I really loved to read and that also provided an escape. Um, I still love to read and then being outside and today kids don't go outside I nearly as often as they missing. ought to. Yep. So I, I'm grateful for those things, but yeah, I mean, I definitely, I didn't like to be in the house. It was, it was hard. It was hard to sense that lon loneliness, I think as a child and to, to know that there was something missing. Um, because as a child, you understand even innately, and it sounds like maybe your grandson kind of understood this when he was quite young, but children understand that there's something, it's not just that they're missing their parent, but that they are owed something yeah. from their parents and they're owed stability, they're owed um, protection, nourishment, nurturing, all of those things that come with a stable upbringing. Um, and they are owed that primarily from their parents. It is a duty that parents have, they have a duty to provide for their children. And, um, you know, when, when that is lost and the foundations of their lives are uprooted in such a traumatic way, um, the reverberations of that are felt for a lifetime. You yeah. feel that your entire life and there are new situations that crop up where uh, that it becomes painfully aware, you become painfully aware that there is this division um, that God did not intend for anybody. That's why he condemns divorce so strongly. Yeah, I think of um there's two things i was thinking 
I forgot the first one, so let me just go to the second one real quick. Um, you know, Deacon Harold Burt Sivers was on my show, and he'd spoken oh, he's and so said, right. he's amazing, the dynamic deacon. And he yeah. said, you know, divorce is like putting your cross down and forcing your children to pick it up. And, and that stuck with me. I never lost that. But one of the things that's such great ironies with, with divorce is, you know, you're one of four, I'm one of four. And when your parents, mom or dad's like, you kids better learn how to get along. And when you're too young, you can't realize, it's like, you and dad don't get along. How, how are you going to teach me? You guys fight. Why can't, mm -hmm. you know, you know, things like that. It, but Oh, there's so many ironies, Angela, so many that, you know, the one I was going to earlier, if you can get along after you guys are divorced, you can get along again in the same house. And as a communication skills expert, I, I try to tell people it's your hardened hearts. It's still the same person you fell in love with, you know, 20, 30, 15 years, whatever. But you've seen their ugly side and we all have that side. Mm -hmm. And so it's making a choice because even if you're with a new person, that new person's gonna have an ugly side and you might say, oh, well, this person's way better than my spouse. It's like, but is that what your children want? Do your children want this person who's way better for you? Is he or she way better for them? You know, mm -hmm. did you have to deal with that? Or go ahead, say what you yeah, want Yeah, my, my mother remarried and I love my stepdad. He's wonderful. Um, he converted to Catholicism and it's very much a faithful man. Um, and that, that was a blessing, but yeah, I mean, it still doesn't change necessarily the whole that exists, uh, or the sense of neglect that you feel, especially in my situation. Um, my dad was pretty much totally uninvolved in my life. And so there's that sense of rejection too. Yeah. It's like, uh, how do I come to terms with, and, and that's not to say, he, you know, I feel like he would probably say that he tries or that he has tried, sure. um, you know, there are different perspectives too, right? But this and, is the child's perspective. And we want those of you to understand there are a lot of you. I work with you yeah. men who are saying, I'm trying, I'm working with one right now. And his wife is doing everything to stop him from seeing his teenage children. And the kids are finally like, mm -hmm. we're not getting in the car. We're not coming. Um, we don't have to, and you can't make us. And so what is he going to do? Oh. Fight with his teenage children that every other week and now he's not even going to get to see them. What is it going to be like in five, 10 years? So you were never around. Was it my right. fault? You know, yeah. so that's. Uh, yeah, so. I mean, it, that's the thing is like these things, you know, as children, I think you learn to put up boundaries, right? I, I mean, you should. The, I find the good that the, the healthier kids have set boundaries. Um, the ones that were continually emotionally gaslit and manipulated and permitted that for whatever reason out of a sense of obligation um a kind of misguided notion of what being respectful looks like uh because that's another thing too is like as a as an adult child of divorce you're always navigating how to best honor your mother and father yes. um and i think that's something that i struggle with so much when i go to reconciliation i feel like i'm that's one of those things i'm bringing back all the time like how am, am i and maybe it's a sense of scrupulosity too, again, because I, I, that sense of desiring to, um, earn love and be worthy. And so I have a habit of overanalyzing everything and asking mm -hmm. continuously, am I dishonoring my parents by X, Y, and Z? Um, or by having have, a radio show that talks about it. You know? Yes, exactly. I mean, that's a, it's not something that I necessarily am advertising a lot of the time that, that we're digging into these really difficult issues because I don't want to hurt my parents. And I don't want them to feel like, like I don't love my stepdad, for example, I would never want to hurt his feelings that way because that's just not true. Um, but things are complicated, right? Like human relationships are complicated, especially when there's division involved. So, uh, yeah, it's, it, it's a continual process, I think, of peeling back the layers, even as I get older and being confronted with new situations with my own kids and um, striving to have the kind of marriage that I didn't you necessarily see had. growing up. Yeah. Right. I am. Um, um, I've now I am so fortunate that neither my mother nor my father remarried after they divorced. So in one sense, I kind of have the best of divorced parents world because when we go to we're going to montana this summer for my um, um nephew's wedding my mom's going out my dad's going out neither of them is bringing another person so it mm. feels like a family still like it's unbroken and we 
in, in that sense, have the best. But for those whose parents did remarry, what I have heard from a lot of the other adult children of divorce is that it gets harder when mom or dad um, has a child with the other person because we necessarily kind of get pushed to the were the kids from the first marriage, they love mm -hmm. together the kids they had with the second marriage more because it's theirs. Did your mom or dad have any children with another person? And is that true for you or is that not true mm -hmm. for you? That's a really good question. So, Sorry if I'm kind of going there. No, um, <laughs> it's just not, not something I've necessarily publicly talked about. But uh, so I have a, a sister that passed away a few years ago. Sister. And shortly after her passing, um, we found out because of some um, DNA testing that my biological dad actually had another child uh, who happens to be the same age as my oldest sister and whose birthday is the day before mine and my twin sisters. So uh, it was kind of interesting to realize, um, you know, here is a whole nother person that I don't know that I'm related to and is my sister and that I will probably never know, at least not in a meaningful way. Yeah. Um, and then on the other side of things, my mom, my mom and my stepdad, and I normally refer to him as my dad, but okay. he, they did have a child, but we were all so much older. My parents had struggled, they had struggled with infertility for many years. And so I was a teenager when my youngest brother was born. And so I never felt like, you know, we had our lives pretty established at that point. I was super involved in school and extracurriculars. And so I never felt like there was any of that there we go it's okay but veronica you do what you need to do um but i, I will love say... all her hair two weeks old she's got more hair than most humans <laughs> she is <laughs> she has more hair than any of my other kiddos perfect um but i will say as a child when my parents remarried and constantly seeking that um that fatherly figure in my life, I felt somewhat like I was in a competition with my, with my step siblings, especially my stepbrother. My stepbrother and I were, are, we're still very close and I love him very dearly. Uh, but I, I felt like I was in competition with him a little bit to get some of that, um, male attention mm -hmm. and recognition. And so I do recall that I was very much a tomboy. Um, thank goodness that it was at an era where I wouldn't have been told I was transgender or lesbian, but, um, <laughs> Uh, but That's I was a, a show tomboy. for another topic. Yeah, too. exactly. <laughs> uh, but I, I did sense that, you know, that, that desire to try and, um, almost compete. And I know it wasn't a competition, you know, as an sure. adult, but yeah, really desiring that sort of positive male influence in my life and that acknowledgement that like I mattered and like, and, and to show me what it means to be a woman, right. As I got older, I think, uh, that's another challenge when you don't have, um, you know, strong parents or, or you feel kind of, um, forgotten about or whatever, or that you have to earn love. Um, you sort of learn things a lot by yourself, I think. And you learn to navigate, uh, the world in a very harsh way because you have to, you have to grow up really young. Yeah. Have you, um, so two questions. Does your mother now understand your perspective since you are kind of outspoken? You just said you kind of protect a little of this. It's not like you want to advertise it. And that's so respectful and honoring. But because you are out there, have you found it easier to navigate this conversation with your mom and or your dad or even your stepdad? Who you call yeah. your dad? So I haven't talked about it with my stepdad. Um, and I'm not sure that I've ever talked about it. I've, I've never talked about it with my biological dad. Um, my mom and I have somewhat discussed it. Uh, she, she listened, I did an interview with Layla Miller and it was an excellent Amazing. interview. Um, and that was kind of a catalyst for us to, to address some of these issues, but I don't think we're in a place where we could have a really honest conversation quite yet because there are a lot of feelings and sometimes our feelings get in the way of the intellect. Um, Surely. or, you know, and so I think, yeah, hopefully someday. 
So hopefully yeah. someday we can have Layla Miller is the author of the book Primal Loss, The Now Adult Children of Divorce Speak. She's also the author of several books, but in particular for this conversation, she wrote Impossible Marriages Redeemed. They didn't end the story in the middle, and I am in that book, so you can find me in there. Oh, my goodness. Because we were separated for four years. I was seeing another man. We were on our way to divorce, and... Amazing wow. things happened and we reconciled, but part of it was my parents' divorce and part of it was the, no, dang it, I got to make this, this has got to be for life. And that was a really a Holy Spirit moment. So when we got back together and things were still so difficult, it was that commi- commitment to the vow that really pulled us through the difficult years. Because there were years where I was like, why did I say yes again? Because I knew it was the right thing to do. And, you know, this year we're going to have our 39th wedding anniversary and I just... I could cry. I pray, praise God that we fought through those difficult years. And so anyway, that's just one of the things I like to put out there that if you're watching this, you can reconcile your marriage. I've had 13 reconciliations of my standers. Standers are people who are standing for marital reconciliation while their spouse is cheating on them, divorcing them, mm. has divorced them, moved on, uh, married the other person. They've divorced the other person many times, come back to the original spouses. Any of you watching, you know, it does not mean it's your destiny. But the, the current position you're in is no different than the one you were in before. So people are like, oh, they'll never get back together. He or she's engaged. I'm like, so what? They were engaged and married to you. That wasn't permanent. This won't be permanent either. Mm-hmm. So um, I love, love, love to always keep the hope in here that divorce, it can just be a temporary status you if you love them once you can love them again it takes work and i can help you with that but you know so i want to kind of plug that now this being said i do also want to acknowledge that not everybody does feel the same there are some adult children of divorce who have said to me i am so glad my parents divorced uh you know my mom my dad was an idiot blah 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 whatever but Mm -hmm. so without speaking for them unless you know that you have implicit permission have you and your sisters have this had this conversation about how they feel about it and are you all feeling the same or varied positions yeah i'm i feel like we would probably have varied positions and part of it is because there was a lot of turmoil uh when we were children now i can see as well that there was a lot of fallout in terms of how my sisters and i each dealt with their divorce and how that impacted us long term um a lot of things that maybe they wouldn't say has to do with the divorce, I would say probably does. Um, but I also love psychology and all that mm-hmm. stuff too. So, um, you know, I think I would look at the situation perhaps a little bit differently. And also in part because I'm the only one that's still a practicing Catholic. Um, There's so that, fallout right there, leaving yeah. the faith. Yep, that is part of it. And I think... Uh, again, because what we do, our family unit unit is meant to um, point us to the Holy Trinity, right? The first family and even the Holy family. Mm-hmm. And when we can't see in our physical world how, how God ordered things, it's really hard to understand him and relate to him. Um, so um, I would say, yeah, our, our opinions would probably be somewhat varied. And I, I'd say yeah, it was a really nasty marriage when I was a child. And again, I I just go back to, um, maybe things were better in terms of a physical sense. I don't know. I can't say that with certitude, but what I can say is that as a child, I, my parents had a duty to reconcile. Um, and, and that meant that they both had to make the choice to reconcile and be proactive. And I think again, it is when he's hurting her and when she's saying mean things to him and it is hard and and in your case you're dealing with alcoholic addictions i mean i don't have to deal with any of that but we're not saying that that's not hard for you guys to deal with that's rigorous um yes but yeah and yeah and it's a big but right because it has eternal consequences in many situations and i'm not here to pontificate on whether or not i think my parents' annulment was j- valid or not. I totally defer to the church on that. That is, the church gets to sort that out. I don't. That's a benefit, I guess, for for me as a lay person. Um, I defer to the church and I trust the church and, and all that. But uh, there, the reality is, is that parents do have a duty to their children. And so that's what I always circle yeah. back to is um, maybe it was better. Maybe my 
dad would have never conquered his addictions or whatever. I don't know. Um, so it's hard to say, but yeah. we can I do put a think... bookmark right there on the annulment for yeah. a minute and come back to that. But oh, yeah, um, I do want to ask you about your husband. Is he the child of divorce? Are his parents intact? And how has yeah. he kind of recognized your insecurities, I guess, initially, mm -hmm. um, divergent ways of looking at your marriage? Because you mentioned earlier, like, he can't possibly love me forever. Mm -hmm. How does he factor in here? He's amazing. <laughs> I just, it's like, I just thank God, literally thank God every day. Um, I'm extraordinarily blessed. I think God has so blessed me and graced my life with him. I'm trying not to get emotional. He's just the Aww, best. That's um, awesome. <laughs> I, when you have difficult moments in yeah. 10 years, we're going to go back to this camera <laughs> shot right here. And I'm going to remind you. Uh, we have had, I mean, we've had, we've, we've gone through a lot. I mean, and I'm sure we will continue to, but he's a very simple man. I'm the one who is very, um, high maintenance in, in my brain, <laughs> you know, and I'm always like, okay, I'm emotional, but also I can usually parse things out intellectually. Yes. Thank goodness. I've got a baby um, on the breast. My reason's a little bit overridden by my <laughs> emotions right now. Give me time. Yeah. I'm hormonal. Okay. <laughs> um, but no, he's amazing. He comes from an intact family. Um, and, his family really prioritize sacrifice. Uh, he grew up on a farm. And so there was a lot of hard work and grit and uh, they, they struggled through poverty and things like that. His parents were married very young and had five kids very quickly. Um, and it's funny, they, he was baptized Catholic, but he didn't know that until we were doing our marriage preparation and he was converting to Catholicism. So, um, you know, they, but they did instill really great values into all of their children and prioritized the family. And so I think for him, things are very simple. And I'm not sure that he really realized for a long time uh, where my brain was at or where some of the things I was going through were coming from, especially uh, after my sister died and things like that. We, that was a whole thing that we had to work through together because um, grief is really complicated um and so there was that aspect and then so I just felt like once I felt safe you know once I was done grieving the loss of my sister and we had a miscarriage right before that and once mm -hmm. things settled down in life and um once I felt safe in our marriage that's when I was able to start examining my upbringing and the the healing that I needed in my life to come to terms with who I am and who God created me to be and how to relate to him and love him as my father um, and to really also learn how to love our lady you know um, yeah. and and embrace both of them as my own so uh, he sort of he's just very patient but I've learned I definitely have to communicate with him <laughs> um, and that's you know, men are not mind readers. And so I don't expect no. him to know what's going on in my brain. And so when I'm really struggling, I've just learned that I've had, I have to be totally transparent with him instead of waiting for him to um, like figure it out <laughs> because he probably won't. What a novel concept. Why I don't know. you even know? Cause I'm not your girlfriend. <laughs> I <know. laughs> I'm like, uh, Don't yeah. just tell me and I'll do everything I can to please you. And yeah. that is one thing, you know, my husband, he's so, he's learned to be so gracious about that. Um, and he's learned to ask and check in and ask how I'm doing with certain things. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm just eternally grateful and mm. I'm very blessed. Let's talk about your Catholic faith in terms of divorce. Do you think, I mean, I praise God, both of my parents put us in a Catholic school. We were in Catholic schools through eighth grade because it just got expensive for high school. And yeah. to this day, both my parents still practice. Of course, we went through a season. Even I, when I went during my own separation, almost divorce, I had a God moment, which I've talked about on the air and other times, not today because it takes too long, where I walked back into the church and the Lord's like, I'm welcome home. And then I thought mm -hmm. to myself, I used to go to church six days a week, five days a week with school. And then Sunday, we never missed. When did I stop going to church? Oh yeah. When my parents got divorced. Mm. And, and so I look at like those breakdowns there, 
But after we all kind of had our window away from the church, my mom, my dad, me, um, we're all back regularly, except for my siblings. I'm the only one of four that attends. And I praise God for giving me God-fearing Catholic parents because my faith, as you've alluded to, has just yeah. been totally instrumental in everything in my life, most specifically my marriage but and my raising of my children. So do you think you would have had uh, as healing, uh, as, as, as been as healed as you are today without your faith? And how do you think it played a factor in that process of healing? Oh, absolutely. I would not be. Um, I don't think that I would be uh, even hardly embarking on this healing journey at this point. Or I think it's really easy to, especially in this age, to find other things and use those as band-aids to pretend like this is what healing looks like. You know, whether you're yeah. obsessing over eating the right diet or um, different types of meditation, yoga. I mean, people invest so much time in all these other things right. um, to find healing. And, um, and so the church has been instrumental for me, especially the sacrament of reconciliation. Obviously it's a healing sacrament. There's mm -hmm. a reason. Um, and it's because it requires us to reflect and to take ownership of the areas of our life that we ought to take ownership of and to leave the rest. Right. So, I think if it weren't for that, I would be really struggling still um, because I wouldn't be reflecting and introspective the way that I need to be. And I wouldn't be striving for that healing in the same sacramental way because our, and that's one thing I think a lot of people who don't understand Catholicism, the sacraments are not for God. For us. Um, he doesn't need the sacraments, but we do. And so he gives them to us as an outlet for us to draw near to him and to draw from those waters, um, the living waters, right? So that's, that's why I love, that's what I, one of the things I just love about being Catholic is being able to draw on that um, and to experience real healing. It's hard healing. I was just thinking about this. My kids were complaining earlier today about how they're, um, one of their hips was hurting and they were going through a growth spurt and growth hurts, right? It doesn't feel good a lot of the time. Um, and same when, when you have something healing like a scab, often it gets itchy and painful before it's totally healed over. And right. even then there might be a scar, but that's the beauty of being human um, and, and embracing those trials so that you can draw near to the Lord. And one of the best ways to do that is through the sacraments and through the wisdom of the church. Yeah, praise God for that. I forgot what you said. Are any of your sisters still practicing the faith? No. So you're um, like me. Yeah. Yeah. My, I have a twin sister and she, she wants to practice, but I think she's afraid. I think she um, is afraid of the commitment um, because then she knows she at least is intellectually honest enough to acknowledge that she would have yeah. to make some significant life changes. And so I have a great deal of respect for that, but I see the desire is there and so please pray for her <laughs> yeah um, as for all of our siblings and yes you know we're not perfect either i mean by gosh that's not what we're trying to say it's just that i'm no. so grateful i actually the more I, I go to church and the more i go to confession the more i think how sinful i am the things that i see that yeah. i didn't even see before yeah. and so it has been a grace to go and say just help me and I can only understand how my siblings dealt with it on, on their behalf as well. So, yes. um, so I want to make sure we talk about, you know, so you're integrated and let's really kind of delve more deeply into your radio show called integrated Angela really is a part of, like you said in the beginning, integrating your faith and your soul. And so what are, what got you into that? What made you say, I, I have a voice, I need to start doing this. And, and what kind of guests do you have? Do you talk about divorce on that show? And I know you've done at least the show with Layla Miller. Yeah, we kind of, I've kind of been touching on everything. I'm used to saying we because I, I've been doing the radio show with my friend Brian for for so many years now. It's been probably five or six years. Um, but I decided to do this radio show. My husband actually kind of was encouraging me for years to start something. And he's, he's the kind of guy where he, he doesn't say something unless he really means it. Oh, nice. He's not, he's not kind of like a outspoken cheerleader. He's definitely more, um, intentional mm -hmm. and reserved. So, uh, when he started saying that, I kind of laughed it off 
Um, but eventually there are just a lot of things I'm really passionate about and they all are, you know, stemming from my Catholic faith and oftentimes, uh, the pro-life work that I've been doing for years now too. I'm so sorry. Oh no, it's okay. Okay. Um, sweetie. When you do a radio show with a new mom or a mom of five and they're all in the house post COVID, everybody's together. Uh, we got to deal with this kind of stuff, but no, that's one of the beautiful things. This is what's so natural. This is life. This is real. And that's what I love. And people always say to me, you're so real. I'm like, yeah, well, I don't know how to be fake. And so no. this is, you know, you have a human that has to stay alive and what a beautiful mm -hmm. attachment. I mean, we can just talk about that, how God has to, I know. you know, keep us attached, but, um, well, so there, and there's quite an integration there too, between the mother child bond, but, um, yeah, integrated really came about at least even the name of it was my last child. Uh, my kids all have uh, lip and tongue ties and often part of the battle is getting their sensories, their, their senses and their primal reflexes to integrate. Um, because a lot of the issues that they can face, like this one, she's struggling cause she has a really severe lip tie. What does that um, mean? That they're, that thing down here, the frenulum the is very tight, tight and attached. So the lip can't move. Okay. Yes. Um, and so that can make nursing difficult or feeding and ha can have long-term consequences as well. But it's also has to do with the nervous system and how the parasympathetic nervous system, um, activates so that they calm down. Um, so a lot of colicky babies really struggle with this. It's very complicated, but basically learning how to help my children integrate their primitive reflexes kind of brought the name to the fore for me. And I realized that a lot of the things I'm passionate about, whether it's on a physical level and helping my kids or even the spiritual level, it was like, it's just things are so disintegrated, you know, like that's, there's so much in the world that is so disintegrated. And I think the reason why so many of us are struggling is because we're wanting integration, but we don't know how to bring that about. And so I wanted to look at, I wanted to use the podcast to look at pretty much any and every topic I can think of and see that how here's the physical reality and what does this mean for us spiritually and how can we bring our, how can we express our inner dispositions and get our, our inner dispositions properly ordered towards heaven um, with an eye on eternal salvation. So that's what I've been talking about with most of my guests, talking with some about, um, the power of forgiveness or conviction with David B. Wright, um, you know, talking about divorce, talking about how the church itself, the, the building points us heavenward, like a beautiful church, right. whether you're Catholic or not, you walk into it and you're just in amazement, right? Because it's mm -hmm. so beautiful. And so beauty is another one of those things that really brings the soul up to heaven and to contemplating eternal things. So i um, really wanting to talk about all these different aspects of our humanity and how they relate to God. And yeah, and really our goal, I mean, your job as a married woman is to get your husband to heaven and his job yeah. is to get you to heaven. And now as a team, your job is to get your children to heaven. And I have a friend over in, in Uganda who just died on Friday and I was devastated. She was only 32 years old in a car accident. But I, you know, I got the kick in my chest, but then I was like, she was so holy. And I, I was like, I'm so happy for you, Rena. I'm so happy for you. It's too soon here, but I'm, I, I look at death so differently than I might have 15 years ago because she doesn't have to deal with any of this garbage and, and, and this isolation and the, the poverty because over in Africa, I mean, just getting food and where am I going to get my next meal from? And so when we keep that eternal perspective and we realize she did it, I have no fear that she's in heaven or purgatory. Um, but there are people that, you know, watching the show, your, jo your job is to get your kids to heaven. I remember when... Um, uh, and again, I, I, there's, there's no judgment, but I was crying when my daughter and her husband were separated and a, a friend at church caught me crying like, what, are you okay? What's the matter? And I said, well, my, my daughter's divorcing, you know, her husband. And she's like, oh, well, my daughter has cancer. So, and her daughter's cancer healed. And I remember, you know, saying to her, I said, but your daughter 
goes to church your daughter knows the lord if your daughter dies of cancer she's in heaven if my daughter dies in divorce or adultery she goes to hell and it's so funny that it didn't strike that devout catholic in the way that i was like we need to change this this yeah. isn't about here i know you don't want to lose your child to cancer you don't want to lose your child at all but if you can lose them if you have your choice our eyes should be fixed on heaven fix your eyes on heaven I just need to get my kids and my grandkids to heaven. Yeah. And uh, it's a rigorous job to do, especially in this year, in this millennium, you know? And I think, too, that's a very um, human tendency, too, to kind of get caught up on the... And, not, and that's not to say it's unimportant, but just kind of on the peripheral things. I mean, I can't think about the bride who get so caught up on every detail that they kind of miss the whole focus on point. the wedding forget about the marriage yeah right yes it's like that you know that's the important part is that you're you're getting married <laughs> you know yeah. all the yeah. other stuff those are incidental and, and they'll be fine you're you that's not the point of what the day is and I think that's that's a very human thing is to just and and that's a tool of the devil right like he deceives yeah. us and he we tries we got to do our best to to see truth yeah. well let's keep this kind of more um on a positive angle in terms of like um focusing on marriage and you know fighting off divorce and stuff what instructions would you have for couples that are dealing with uh the contemplation of divorce right now what, what would you say to them mm -hmm. and then i'll ask you about what you would say to other adult children of divorce let's go with the parents oh that's a really good question I'm brilliant that way, you know. <laughs> well, it, I just saw a woman post in a group that I'm a part of yesterday uh, that she was thinking about leaving her husband, but she was afraid because she has kids and, you know, what that would do. And my, always my first thing is seek reconciliation and keep, Good. keep seeking reconciliation. Um, and that's, and if, if your spouse is not on the same page as you, I think it's really important that you do everything in your power to try and, and bridge whatever that gap is that is keeping you guys apart. And so right. it's kind of like, a, I know a lot of therapy, a lot of couples will, if, if both couples won't do therapy, then just one will do therapy. And usually there's improvement, even if just the one is going to therapy. Um, right. But I think honoring But if your, your therapist spouse, is divorced, yeah. If your therapist is in a second or third marriage, yeah, don't maybe go to that them. That would be different. Yeah. But keep going. Yeah. I'm sorry. No, that's okay. I just feel so bad. I'm sorry. Well, I just feel um, bad for Veronica. No. There we go. Um, she is so grabby. It's okay. Uh, we, we'll we'll but, go shorter so you can go and do what you have I to do. I am so sorry. No, it's okay. Um, so what would you but, say to those people contemplating? Reconcile. Yeah, so I would continue to seek reconciliation. Pray go to your priest, um, and, and to talk openly with your spouse, not in a condemning way or an attacking way, but find, find ways to communicate with your spouse. So you can learn what it is, what the barrier is. And also to recall that love is a choice. It's, it's an act of the will. It's not an emotion and, and marriage not is gonna going to be easy. Sometimes you're gonna living with someone who can say jerky things. Yeah. And we can all say jerky things too. Yeah. You know I mean, yeah. so I think those are the first places that I would start if you need to separate because, you know, your spouse isn't going to listen to you because, or, oh, well, she's still happy because she's still here. I'm like, well, sometimes you need to separate just so they can wake up and go, oh, wow, he, he or she was serious. You know? Yeah, there's that too. I think especially if you're coming from a relationship where one spouse is really used to manipulating and gaslighting. Yeah. Um, or like in your really... case, your dad was an alcoholic. You know, the, the fact that your mom could have said, I'm going to leave. You need to get help. You know, we'll get back together once you fix it. Because once it's permanent, the person has no, no reason, no incentive to, to keep working yeah. at it. They're like, well, she's gone. But if, if you're like, I won't divorce you because I don't want to go to hell and I don't believe in divorce, but I'm not living with you, I will stay separate. Look me up. DrChristineBacon.com, 757-343-0368. Uh, Call me. I will help you work through hatred. I will help you work through pornography. I will help you work through alcoholism. And how can you stay married through those things? There is help. Divorce is, is oh, let me just say this. You know, according to the church, according to Christ, um, abuse doesn't unmarry you. 
alcoholism doesn't unmarry you. Narcissism doesn't unmarry you. Divorce doesn't unmarry you. Uh, so how do you navigate living with those things? If you're divorced anyway, divorced in the eyes of the world, you're still married in the eyes of God. So yeah. I'm sorry you have to deal with the brokenness of alcoholism. I'm sorry you have to deal with the brokenness of pornography. I'm sorry you have to deal with infidelity. But your job is to get each other to heaven. And we, uh, that's my expertise. Look me up. Let me ask you one more thing here. Um, for adult children of divorce, I mean, on the outside, you look like you've navigated it well. You know, healthy, happy family. What would you say to a child or adult child of divorce? It's probably older teenagers or adults watching this show. What would you say to them to give them hope or direction or guidance? Well, first I would say I'm sorry. <laughs> Like, I'm sorry that you experienced that. Um, and no, you're not as resilient as everyone wants you to be. Um, you know, I think kids ha often have to fake being resilient, um, but really children just learn to adapt, right? Mm -hmm. So I think the hope is that you do have a God who loves you and you don't have to earn his love. Um, and we have this spiritual family, whether it's the rest of the church or the sacraments, other people in the church and also the saints um, to draw from their wisdom, but also that you don't have to replicate in your own life the mistakes that your parents have made. And that's where you get to be self-determining in that way. Um, to the best of your ability. And I always feel bad as Layla does. She talks about the abandoned spouse. Yeah. Um, and that's a, that's a reality too, but you don't have to make a conscious decision to replicate those things in your life and you can break those cycles. And so I find a lot of hope in that. Excellent. So name one thing you'd have our listeners do differently as a result of something they heard today. If you're not going to reconciliation every other week, start. That's a good one. All right, one more thing. It's a kind of a fill in the blank. When I die, I will know my life has been a success if. If my husband makes it to heaven <laughs> and my children. That is awesome. Well, I have enjoyed this. Where can our uh, viewers find you? Well, they can visit my website, integratedangela.com, or find my podcast. Um, my podcast is Integrated with Angela Erickson, and I'm on every major platform. So uh, feel free to find me there or, or on social media. Um, you should be able to find me as Integrated Angela or on Twitter at Angela Thinks <laughs> or mm -hmm. A. Erickson Thinks, I think is what I'm at. But yep, you can find me under that, Angela, Integrated with Angela Erickson. Uh -huh. Excellent. Well, I am so grateful, you guys. We have a link to her show, a website here, so you can just click on that, and you'll be able to go right to Angela's website. Also, I'd appreciate it if you would if, like and follow me on all the same platforms, Rumble, this one, um, and my website. And it's a plea I've been making at the end of most shows that I wish I didn't have to make, but censorship is very real. I've already had at least one show censored, um, the powers that be do want to silence perspectives like this that don't agree with the cultural narrative. And you are surely going to start finding more and more of the people that you respect or have listened to or watched no longer coming up on your feed. And I have to tell you, the time is over for you to be a passive recipient of whatever comes through your feed. You need to start going, bookmarking, finding those people. Because one day, no one with a perspective other than the mainstream culture will be found on this uh, platform here. So go find me on Rumble. Be active. Also, go and subscribe to the newsletters of people like me or Angela or those others that you love because they are dipping into websites as well. I've recently seen where they're telling America's frontline doctors that we don't like what your website teaches. So they're thinking of shutting the website down. So... Again, subscribe to our newsletters. That way we can send you the information that you need. And I hate having to do that because it's pretty heavy. It's pretty dark. Um, and I'm a hopeful, optimist kind of cheerleader person. So, um, and that being said, 
uh, I appreciate you, Angela. I appreciate what you have done, your beautiful way of just speaking the truth in love without judging or shaming anybody. I think all of us need to kind of learn how to do that with grace, with grace. You know, push, pushing and having people fall in love with the Catholic faith is, mm -hmm. it's like nothing you've ever known to just fall in love with God. Thank you so much. I really yeah. appreciate that. Any last things you want to say before we go off the air? Bless you. Bless you. Um, no, I just, um, thank you so much for giving me this time today to share that with you and um, giving an additional mouthpiece to little Veronica. I know she's <laughs> so, so Thank sweet. you for your patience. And Aww. of course now she's perfect happy. hi veronica hi honey well to all of you watching thank you for watching please go look at all the other shows that i've had god has given me amazing guests father james altman christine watkins jesse romero former satanic high wizard uh, zachary king i have had topics that are all over the place awesome so um, go, go peruse my website, breakfastwithbacon.com, and go to Angela's website as well, integratedangela.com. Did I get that right? Yes, you did. Awesome. Well, we do have to go off the air, and I forgot to tell Angela how I do it, so I'm going to have to do it by myself. I am Dr. Christine Bacon. You've been watching Breakfast with Bacon, and I'd like to remind you always to live your life sunny side up. All right.